Hi, my name is Ryan Nodick. I'm a research technician at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. And like many of you right now, our team is also staying at home, as you can see. And we really hit the pause button on a lot of our field work. But while we're all in the same boat, I figured that this was the perfect time to share with you all a glimpse of the really exciting research that we've been doing lately. And have you join us in this virtual escape where we can take you out of your homes into the field and on the water and talk about some of these really cool projects. So let's go ahead, get on the water and talk about one of those research projects. So here we are heading out bright and early with a charter off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida to work with an overfished species of shark called the black nose shark. This is a smaller coastal species of shark that gets its name from the black smudge on its nose, and it's often caught on rod and reel from the Carolinas to Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, most of these sharks that are caught are released, which is a great first step towards rebuilding their population. But as we've seen in the case of many other species, capture and handling can actually impact their longer term health. And in some cases, those sharks that were thrown back overboard may not actually survive. The kicker is that we really don't know anything about this for black nose shark. So while it's great that they're being released, we still need to know more about how fishing is impacting these sharks after they swim away. So to figure all that out, the first thing we needed to do was fish for these sharks using normal fishing practices. And with the help of charter captains, find these sharks, whether that was right off the beach with NASA's launch pads in the background, or just a couple hundred yards off of the Cocoa Beach Pier. Then the fun part, fighting the shark on rod and reel. Now, while one person fights the shark, I'll make note of the tackle it's being fought on and where it's landed, how long it took to reel in. These are all important pieces of information that might help to explain how this type of fishing impacts these species if using certain tackle or under certain conditions. Next, we'll bring the shark on board for sampling, and the first thing we'll do after carefully restraining the shark is take a quick, small blood sample from underneath its tail. The blood is then immediately put on ice and analyzed on board, right after the shark is released with an instrument called an iStat. This will measure certain biomarkers in the blood, such as the lactate concentration and pH level, both of which can tell us a little bit about whether or not the individual was physiologically stressed. For example, we would consider a shark with high lactate concentrations and a low pH level to be experiencing some degree of stress that the shark would need to recover from after being released. The next step is tagging the shark with an acceleration data logger tag that will monitor its movement after release. Now these tags are fixed to the dorsal fin of the shark using what's called a galvanic timed release, which is a piece of metal that corrodes in seawater, so that the tag will eventually detach from the animal within a few days and float to the surface where it can then be recovered by tracking down the VHF transmitter that is also embedded in the tag. The tags themselves will be recording acceleration of the shark at a very high resolution, 25 times per second and the water depth and temperature the shark is swimming in as well. This information can even be used to help visualize the body posture of the shark and individual tail beats while swimming. Put all of this together, we can get a really good idea of what happened to the shark after it was released, whether or not its behavior changed because of capture, and most importantly, whether or not the shark survived. Now, after releasing these sharks, we're gonna wait until the next morning to go find these tags, or up to three days based on that time release that we chose. And to find the tags, we're gonna use these headphones, this receiver, and this antenna. But much like we have to wait for those tags to pop up, we're actually gonna make you wait to the next post to learn more about the tag recovery process, and also dive more into what these sharks are up to after they're released, and just how much fishing is actually impacting these sharks. And I also have a few tags with me that we recovered a couple months ago. Um, and I'll be sharing with you some really cool stories about what happened to these sharks. So thanks for watching this post and stay tuned for the next one.